I mean, if you think about Donald Trump, like he has not earned anybody's trust. Like what has he done? Like I worked in the administration. He didn't do anything that he said, anything good. And I use the term good in the sense of you're a Republican conservative. You think what they did on this economic policy is good. That wasn't Donald Trump. That was like one of his Republican minions that just got to do whatever they wanted. And thankfully, that particular batch of political appointees might have actually been competent. Donald Trump is not competent. He doesn't actually know how to deliver on any of this. And and that's, I mean, that's where I come to the conclusion that so much of this is just, we're deceived. Like my, I say, we, my community, my community is deceived. This guy has not earned your trust. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Now, we've been talking a lot about the rise of Christian nationalism and extremism in America. But as we come up on the 4th of July, we need to talk about how we can't let these self-described patriots strip our country of everything that makes it special in the name of a God that the founding fathers deliberately kept separate from our founding documents. To be clear, The framers didn't include religious stipulations like there shall be no religious tests for any office or public trust in the Constitution or follow it up with including no law representing an establishment of religion or permitting the free exercise thereof in the Bill of Rights because they were a bunch of atheists, but mostly because they were men of faith. The framers included these statements because they believed in what Thomas Jefferson referred to as the separation of church and state. It wasn't so much to protect the state from the church. You're free to speak your religious values from any place in government, and Congress has been opening each day's proceedings with a prayer since 1789. But so the government couldn't interfere in religion. The founders were adamant that government and religion should not mix. And yet here we are with some of the most violent, divisive rhetoric and actions in this country coming from self-described Christians, which is why I'm having former U.S. security advisor and counterterrorism expert Elizabeth Newman on the show today. Elizabeth served as the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security under President Donald Trump after starting her career in the George W. Bush White House. Now an ABC News contributor and chief strategy officer at Moonshot, Elizabeth is also the author of the new book, Kingdom of Rage, The Rise of Christian Extremism and the Path Back to Peace. A literal expert on both sides of the story, Kingdom of Rage is an incredible book that paints the picture of where we sit in America and where the danger really lies. But it's also written from a place of belief. That if you have a Christian in your family or in your life who appears to worship Trump and the MAGA movement, then this might be the exact book you need to start a conversation from a place of peace. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, former Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security, terrorism expert, and author of the incredible new book, Kingdom of Rage, Elizabeth Newman. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to join you. Oh, well, thank you for coming and thank you for writing this book. I'm actually really excited you're here. As I was saying to you, I started following your work years ago. In fact, I did a rant on your work on rising extremism in December 2020. At the time, I was doing a lot of research on the rising extremism in America and the radicalization of American citizens. And your work really stuck out to me because one of the things you said was that you lie awake at night thinking about the danger. And I thought, yeah, me too, except here's this person who works in counterterrorism and homeland security and in the Trump administration. Here's a person who really knows what's going on. And she's also terrified. And that really meant something to me. Yeah, it, gosh, December 2020, that was really dark. Right? Um, I know. I I think it was dark because we were actually seeing the the growth of what eventually manifested on January 6th. But there were those moments of protest. And there was, do you remember the Jericho March that happened in December of 2020? This was like a bunch of MAGA and Christians came together and they marched around Washington. I don't know if they actually marched around Washington, but they said that they were going to march around Washington praying like the Israelites did for the battle of Jericho. So there was like all of this rhetoric of war, of spiritual battle, and it started to go, okay, so this is not just white supremacism. This isn't just militia. Cause that's, if you go back to February of 2020, when I was 
talking to Congress. That's what I was worried about. I was I was worried about lone actors, and I was worried about just this growing metastasizing threat of domestic violent extremists in very traditional categories. By December 2020, it's like this this is something else. This is like it's all coming together. And it's like normie people, people that we would meet at the grocery store or at the PTA meeting, and they are getting caught up in this call for violence and this idea that they've got to fight. And and that's December 2020. It was gosh, it was scary. It really was. And that's why I was doing research at the time. And I was trying to explain it. I didn't have the podcast yet. I was still just doing rants. And at the time you were saying that it was the conservative media in many ways that was like a portal to another reality, this reality where the election was stolen and Trump was a hero and a victim and Democrats were these evil monsters trying to take away America and we were all living in a tyranny. And you said that people had fallen down a rabbit hole and become radicalized in their thoughts. And unless we helped, and you use the term break the deception, the country was going to become increasingly difficult to operate. And then I think, well, look where we are now, right? Like you were entirely right. Yeah. I, it's actually kind of disheartening. You remember that there was that moment right after January 6th where we're like, okay, this is going to be it. This is like, we're going to have a, the spell will break and people are going to come back to normalcy. And there were some that like we actually did watch during the inauguration, the company I, I work for works in the online spaces. And, and th- we were able to see in real time people going, oh, so this QAnon thing isn't right. This isn't real. Like nothing happened. We were expecting this. Yeah, the storm didn't this, come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there was, there were people that were immediately disillusioned and left, but there were a whole lot more that just kind of doubled down. And then we had this, you know, brief, I don't know, 48 hour moment where everybody's like, this has gone too far. Like Donald Trump, you should be impeached. And then they all started going down to Mar-a-Lago again. And they're like, I know the Lindsey Grahams and the, <laughs> and the like, Kevin McCarthy's and the Mitch McConnell's who were like, enough is enough. And then literally 24 hours later, they were like, we will kiss the ring. It was the most bizarre thing. It was so bizarre. And and here we are four years later and people are like, well, I wish I had better choices than the the two guys that are on the ballot this year. And you're like, you had a chance. You could have impeached Donald Trump. Like he wouldn't be allowed to run for office. That was the tool. That was the tool that needed to be used. You impeach him. Yeah, the Republicans needed to remove him. He yes. was impeached. He'll always be impeached, but they needed to vote yes, to sorry, remove the him and they didn't convict, take that option. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, it was yeah. so frustrating. It is yeah, frustrating. It was so, it's still so frustrating because you can't believe the doubling down goes on, the doubling down goes on, the doubling down. Now, listen, You started your career as part of the George W. Bush Homeland Security Council after 9-11. So I assume you believed your career would be protecting the country from a global threat of terrorism rather than what we're looking at now, which is, of course, the rise of domestic terrorism. Absolutely. I was in D.C. on 9-11 watching the Pentagon um, burn as I was trying to get out of the city. And then I have this memory of seeing the Capitol in my rearview mirror and wondering if it was going to be there the next day. Because at the time, we there were still planes in the sky, utter chaos. Like, people might not remember, or if you weren't alive then, like, our comms didn't work. We couldn't, cell phone service was down. Like, we, we were reliant on radio to understand what was happening. And it was really scary. And thankfully, because of the brave men and women of Flight 93... The Capitol did stand. And yes, it it was this moment for me of, okay, whatever it takes, I don't want America to ever have to go through this again. That was just so horrific. What do we need to do to secure? And whatever small part I could play, that's what I wanted to do. And then flash forward 20 years later, January 6th not only was, you know, sad for other reasons, but as a security person, you're like, oh, we failed. Like, we failed. We somehow have managed to protect from another 9-11 style attack, you know, that devastation in terms of the size and scale and the number of people that were killed. But we we failed to see the threat from within. I mean, it's it's it was an intelligence failure, but not because the intelligence wasn't there. It was because we refused to see the intelligence. We refused to understand yeah. what it meant. That really was a gut punch. January 6th is not 9-11, but people did die. A lot of people were injured. A number of people can't can no longer work in the the careers, their law enforcement careers anymore because of what happened on that day. But it's also just it's a psychological scar for us, right? Like something broke. All of a sudden, the idea that 
uh, the way to get what you want politically is to just fight physically. It, that something broke in us that day, and and I, we haven't recovered, and that creates more threat, more risk for us. But it's also just kind of disheartening that we're we're continuing to live in this space of such division and such. We can't even agree on the facts of what happened on January 6th. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of, it's so stunning. It's so different than 9-11. At 9-11, we were unified. Look, a lot of bad decisions got made too after 9-11. It's not, it's not that we were perfect back then. It's just that we were unified in purpose and unified in our grief and wanted to come together to, to build a, a safer, better world. You can't get people to agree on that vision anymore. And that and it's very sad, but it's also very concerning from a security perspective. A hundred percent. And I think it's not even that we can't agree on the facts. It's just that if we agreed on the facts, it wouldn't serve the narrative of the people that it needs to serve. You know, they are better off telling us the wrong facts because it serves what their overall goal is. I mean, you were just pointing out that we've had so many government agencies identify these extremists in our society to, you know, drive attention to protecting our citizens from the growing threat of domestic terrorism. But most of them have just been ineffective. It's not like we don't know it's happening. It's not like we don't know there's neo-Nazi groups or Christian nationalist groups or white nationalist groups, or even that these groups have infiltrated our police and military because the FBI has told us this. It's just that we're not doing enough about it. Yeah, that is maybe one of the most concerning pieces of where we are as a country that post 9-11 period, it took a long time to put reforms in place to pass laws, to, to update policies, you know, try this. Oh, that doesn't work. We're going to try this other thing. You really don't get the apparatus or the structures and the systems in place for at least four or five years. And then it's another 10 years to mature that. So it's, you know, 2015 ish by the time that you can look at what we built post 9-11 and go, okay, this is working. There's room for improvement, but this is working. We haven't even started on domestic terrorism. Like the, we're not having the difficult conversations about what laws need to be changed. The executive branch is doing what they can. When I was serving, we at my level tried to do as much as we could. We weren't allowed to do much more because Donald Trump didn't like the word domestic terrorism. Unless we're talking about Antifa, he's happy to use it in that context. But he viewed domestic terrorism as either a criticism of himself or yeah, because those are his people. Yeah. Once you identify with something, that's it. You can't be, you can't be critical of yeah, it. Yeah. So, yeah. so we were, we had to kind of keep it below the radar and you government doesn't work well like that because it really does require the president to say, my policy is this, it aligns budgets. It tells people there's never enough resources to do all of the mission. So if you don't have that prioritization, then it, it just gets down on the margins and it's not enough for the, the size and the scale of the threat that we face. We really need to be having the tough conversations about legal changes that might be needed in our laws, about structural changes in the different organizations. Did you know, Lee, there's, there's not even an organization that is a legally designated to be responsible for painting the threat picture for domestic terrorism. Now, the FBI and the DHS like have enough authority to be able to do it, but they have not been told by Congress, you shall do this. The NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, has that mission for the overseas threat picture, but they don't have the ability to necessarily do that for domestic tourism where they have a lot of restrictions. So like even just the basics of whose job is it? Like who do we hold accountable? Like that hasn't even been done. And that's that's like not even like you're just stepping up to the plate. You haven't even gotten on base yet. That's where we are yeah. with this uh, and we threat. should have done that way back with Timothy McVeigh, you know, right. like we couldn't, That's what we right. could have done, you know, back then with the Oklahoma City bombing, if we had had a, a mechanism in place for domestic terrorism, if we'd been able to say this is a domestic terrorist and we're going to go after it like we would an international terrorist and we're going to find the cells that helped him and we're going to do all this stuff, but we didn't do it. We didn't change the policies then. And here we are years, years, years later dealing with the same thing. I mean, as your career evolved, you started to see that the greatest threats to Americans was not from these religious religious fundamentalists in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, but from white nationalists and radicalized religious fundamentalists here in America, particularly from the American Evangelical Church, which of course, you know, you're part of that tradition. And you testified before Congress, as you were saying, on February 2020, warning about 
another anti-Semitic attack, a white supremacist terrorism, how this was all a threat, and you believed it was building to another attack. So I'm sure January 6th wasn't really that much of a surprise to you. But like you said, that's not what the Trump administration wanted to hear. And right after that testimony, you resigned from your role at the Department of Homeland Security. And what I am extrapolating to be some form of protest of failed leadership of the Trump administration, would that be a fair assessment? It is. Even that quote that you brought up about the uh, another attack, I couldn't put that in my testimony. So we had a staffer go to a member and plant a question so that I could answer it based on their question. Because the way it works in government is if you're testifying, you're testifying on behalf of the department. So a whole bunch of people edit and write your testimony. And we knew that I couldn't say something like that. So uh, yeah, like even the ability to sound that warning, I had to do it kind of in a back, back Through channel security. way. Yeah. Like, yeah, back channel way. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so you wrote Kingdom of Rage, wonderful book, and it's sort of a deep dive into a society that has encouraged the radicalization of white supremacists and anti-government types and other far-right terrorist organizations by co-opting Christian symbols and culture and sort of perverting the teachings of what should be a faith based on kindness and do unto otherness, I would say, into what you've called this unholy marriage of right-wing politics and Christian exceptionalism. And it seems like you've written the book in part to help reverse this trend that will only end up undermining both American democracy and American Christianity. Would you say that's fair? Yes. My heart here was not to bash. That doesn't mean that there isn't plenty to criticize. There is. But my heart really was like, my my community is sick. And the way that we address sickness is we tell the truth. We we diagnose. We try to understand how, like, the, the causes of the sickness. It's one thing to just say, like, oh, I see these surface symptoms. It's important to understand the underlying disease. So the first part of the book is is trying to unpack that, like, through a counterterrorism lens. Like, this is how my profession sees this illness, and this is how we became vulnerable, and here's how people radicalize. The second part of the book is, okay, what do we do about it? And this is, like, maybe... The most exciting part for me is, you know, 20 years post 9-11, we've been trying to figure out why do people radicalize? What are the causes? And how do we stop it? And in particular, because we got to this moment in around 2017, 2018, where the Intel analysts were telling us we have more terrorists today than we did on 9-11. And so we we can't look at that and go, hey, look, we won the global war on terror. No, actually, we created more terrorists in the process. Now, there, yeah. there hasn't been a 9-11. That's awesome. But we that can't be the only goal. The goal has to be that, that we eradicate that tool. Terrorism is a tactic used by extremists. So when you start to think about like what makes an extremist, how does how does someone move into that pathway where they are believing that hostile action is necessary to achieve either their success or their survival? And and when you start to go down that path, we we start to understand it's actually not ideology, it's not a faith, it's not the Muslim faith, it's not the Christian faith that drives it. It is underlying psychosocial factors, things like the need for significance, the need for belonging, experiencing a humiliation as a group or as an individual. These are common factors in people that we study who have either committed a terrorist attack or have gone to join an extremist movement. Now, look, that, I mean, when I, when you talk about belonging and significance, th- those are like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like every human being has a need to, to feel like they belong and they have community. Every human being has a need to feel significance. And when we don't have those needs met, there's a variety of negative behaviors that often ensue. So it's not just that this leads to extremism. It's, it also leads to opioid addictions. It also leads to gang affiliations or, you know, suicide rates, deaths of despair. There are a number of ills that come from these underlying psychosocial needs, which is maybe why for too long, we just kind of focused on ideology because it, it it almost seemed like too simple. You know, other people study, you know, the deaths of despair. And, and it's only been in the last five or seven years that we've kind of all kind of gone, huh, well, 
the the real cause is not this narrative that somebody read. That it's just that something happened that made that person more open to that narrative. That that narrative started to meet a need, and I would argue that it it falsely meets a need. It, it ends up being empty in the end. It doesn't actually satisfy the significance of the belonging that you're looking for. Once you realize that's the, the underlying cause, then you shift your tactics of how you prevent. It's less about countering ideology. It becomes more about better understanding why do we have so many people in this country that feel threatened, that their significance feels threatened, or that they aren't connecting with human beings that you, you're probably tracking, like even the Surgeon General has issued a warning about loneliness in this country. So this is not just one group of people. All of us as a society are increasingly more isolated, increasingly struggling uh, with that sense of belonging. And I would argue at some, some levels, our sense of significance, it's a lot to unpack as to the why, but when, at least if we come back to how do we prevent extremism, how do we prevent terrorism, we start to focus more on those drivers and we start to figure out what, what can we do at a individual level to meet those needs as well as at a community level. I think especially for youth, what can we do to, to shore up those vulnerabilities that are so prevalent within our society today? And it, my hypothesis is if we can do that, we can reduce violence. At least that's what the data tells us. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So, you know, we're, we're in a, a time of great change and people aren't sure what to do in a time of great change. It is very alarming. And there's kind of uh, this gap between the way things were and the way things are going to be. And that gap makes people nervous. And so they often lean back to what they know or they grasp at something they think will hold them up. And whether that's the MAGA movement, white nationalism, a, a, a group like the Oath Keepers or the Three Percenters that make them feel like they belong. We've lost our third spaces. So we just, we're sort of stuck between our work and our home. And then we go on our phone and that isolates us. So there's a lot to unpack. And if we could make people feel less lonely, less isolated, less alone, it would probably really affect how easily they fall into these groups. And, you know, your book really does a great deep dive into the history of Christianity's intersection with these not so great ideas in America, particularly white nationalism, Christian nationalism, but also any of the sort of patriarchal, misogynistic, racist ideologies and the groups that that sort of revolve around those, which I think is helpful for us as citizens and voters to know. And I'm sure it's very difficult to do all this research from your perspective and look critically at the dark side of your own religion. It's something that you believe so wholeheartedly. And I know that when I wrote my book, it was all about how government works and politics and the history of the country. And there's a lot of things that make you feel uncomfortable when you really dig down into the history of our country. And as someone who would call herself a patriot, it didn't make me feel so proud, right? But it reminds me of that quote that basically says history should not make you feel proud all the time. In fact, if you're reading history and always feeling proud, you're not reading history, you're reading propaganda. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. It's like you have to be able to look at something and go, okay, here's where we're blowing it. And let's be really open-minded about that, which is why I think you're such a perfect person to write this book, because here you are a former security secretary in the Trump administration, homeland security expert and devout Christian explaining this radicalization of people who are in the same faith as you. So I feel like that's a great combination. Yeah, it, it was challenging to write in that it, I started I with a hypothesis and much like your experience, you start to dig deeper and you're like, oh man, Oof. there's like, where's the, yeah. is there anything redeeming here? Um, and, and the answer is yes. There, there are many beautiful things about the Christian faith, but there's also like, it's just a, a hit trail littered with, horrific abuses. And in more recent history, just a lot of people that you can never know somebody's heart, but just based on their their actions, I think people that were really caught up in power, very prideful people, it, you know, people that you kind of question, like, were you ever were you ever really a Christian at all? Was this just all an act for you? And there's a verse in, in scripture where Jesus says, you know, woe to you who cause the the little ones to stumble because it'll be better for you to have a millstone put over your neck and thrown into the sea. I, there's part of me that that feels that the Lord might be saying that to a number of Christian leaders in this country from the last couple of decades, because there, the deception that we have on a mass scale occurring within the Christian community, it's not because 
most of those people are are evil people. It, they're they're probably lovely people. I know some of them. I love them. <laughs> I'm like. Um, Maybe right, right, um, but they're <laughs> self-serving. Well, but and, yeah. but also, they've been trained to think a certain way. They've been, you know, catechized, if you will, not in the ways of Jesus. They've been catechized in the way of American Christianity. American Christianity is is not the way of Jesus, and that's part of why you you actually do see quite a number of people who are deconstructing. I think I even say it in the book. I'm not deconstructing my faith. I'm deconstructing my politics out of my faith. Like, am I believing that because that's what my faith teaches? Or am I believing that because I grew up in a culture where this is what we believe because we're Republicans? And, you know, Republican and Christian were like almost interchangeable terms at that point. And and so you you do have to kind of pull things apart and go, well, what What's actually evidence based as opposed to just the talking points that we all heard from Rush Limbaugh in the 1990s? And then, like, what's actually from scripture? And and I, I mean, it it is kind of heartbreaking actually to see people take such complex things like immigration or you know border security. They're not, not easy answers, and overly simplify them and and to the point where like they they start with policy and then they, they're dehumanizing a migrant. And somewhere in the middle of that, you find out that they're a Christian and you're like, so, so you don't actually need to do the whole widow, care for the widow, the orphan, the, the sojourner, like that, all of those verses in scripture, you just can ignore. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to come where I come out on the policy of it, but I, I do think that regardless of your policy, like your primary allegiance as a believer should be that we're commanded to love our neighbor. And our neighbor is not, it's not geographically defined. It's not like, oh, only American citizens are our neighbor. Like there's nowhere in scripture that actually gives us that boundary. In fact, it's the opposite. It says you should care for the sojourner. Well, there's also plenty of Americans that don't look exactly like you, that aren't the same color as you, that don't believe the same things as you, that don't love the same people as you. There's lots of our neighbors that are totally different. I mean, I often think that I can't help but feel that if there was a second coming, Jesus would be very furious with a lot of his followers, right? I mean, it would be lovely to get back to a place where Christianity could be Christianity without the political division and misinformation and this kind of rising hate and blame, because you clearly seem to think there's this like stew of contemptuous politics, conservative Republican politics and religion that combines very toxically with our gun culture and the way the right wing works. And it's really hard to, to disassociate those two things because the right wing is working so hard to strengthen the divisions because it serves them and their agenda. Now, you obviously think that the government can play a major part in preventing these things from growing and preventing future attacks, but that the real change needs to come from within the actual church itself. Can you explain those two parts? Remember I told you I bought seven boxes of mosh bars? Seven. And I don't get them for a discount and they don't give them to me for free. I paid full price for the only protein bars I like and they're almost gone. Ultimately, I don't eat that well during the day, but I know I have to put something in my body to keep it from collapsing and I found mosh bars are the way to go. I've talked about Mosh Bars a lot, but maybe you heard about them on Shark Tank. Mosh is a company founded by Maria Shriver and her son Patrick Schwarzenegger with a simple mission to create a conversation about brain health through food, education, and research. Mosh joined forces with the world's top scientists and functional nutritionists to make something beyond your average protein bar. With 10 delicious flavors, including three that are plant-based, each Mosh bar is made with ingredients that support brain health, like lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. But I guess it's good I'm almost out of them because now Mosh bars come with a new look and formulation, featuring the first and only brand boosted with Cognizant, a premium nootropic that supplies the brain with patented form of citicoline. So in non-science talk, brain boosters. And here's the best part. Mosh donates a portion of all proceeds from your order to fund gender-based brain health research at the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. Two-thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women, and Mosh is working closely to close that gap between men and women's health research. I'm always going on about their lemon and white chocolate flavor, but honestly, they're all good. My boys love the cookies and cream and the chocolate peanut butter crunch. So if you want to find ways to give back to others and fuel your body and brain, Mosh bars are the perfect choice for you. 
Head to moshlife.com slash politicsgirl to save 20% off plus free shipping on either the Best Sellers Trial Pack or the new Plant-Based Trial Pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on either the Best Sellers or Plant-Based Trial Pack at M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash politicsgirl. Thank you, Mosh, for continuing to sponsor the Politics Girl podcast. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have right now, would you be able to tell me? How about how much they cost? Most people think they could, and most people are wrong, which is why it feels like money is just flying out of your account, but you have no idea where it's going. Well, it's probably going to subscriptions. Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, parenting apps, it's kind of endless. I'm guilty of this. I often sign up for things and then forget I did it and then keep paying without ever using that app or service, which is why Rocket Money is so great. Rocket Money helps you find what subscriptions you're actually spending money on and cancel the ones you don't want anymore. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. You can see all your subscriptions in one place, and if there's something you don't want, you can cancel it with a tap. You don't even have to talk to customer service. Rocket Money will even try and get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of that bill and Rocket Money does the rest. It's a terrific service, which is probably why Rocket Money has over 5 million users, saving a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions and its members an average of $720 a year. So stop wasting your money on things you don't use and cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. That's rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. Rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. And finally, I haven't talked about the Politics Girl Premium subscriber package in a while, and today felt like the time because earlier this month I was able to meet with my wonderful subscribers in DC and then New York, and next week I have a meet and greet with the LA subscribers. I'm only out of my living room and in this studio because people who appreciated what I do wanted to help me stay independent. And I was only able to do my book, A Return to Common Sense, that's coming out in September, thanks to the patronage of the Politics Girl family. And despite the fact that they won't hear these acknowledgements because they get this podcast ad-free, I still want to publicly thank them for their support and let those of you who aren't subscribers know how very much it means to me to have people believe in what I'm trying to do here. As you may or may not know, I started the Politics Girl Project from my home as a way to deal with my worries about the country and my fears of the direction I thought we were headed. I started on YouTube with online civics and then moved to the rants on TikTok as a way to break down complicated ideas into bite-sized pieces and then to the podcast for deeper dives into important topics without the spin you get from the corporations. Over the past four years, my followers, people who care about democracy and truth, have grown to over two million people. Our videos now have hundreds of millions of views. We've won two Webbies, launched this podcast, and I've written a book. I don't say that because I think I'm cool, but because I believe it's incredibly hopeful to know that there are that many people out there who care about what's going on and want to know and quite frankly, do more. I don't like to ask for help. I find it uncomfortable. I started this project from a place of altruism, but it has taken on a life of its own and independent work like mine is only possible with individual support from people like you. So if you would ever consider supporting me in doing this quality of work, please check out and potentially subscribe to Politics Girl Premium. Click on the link at the bio or you can click on the link at the top of the page at politicsgirl.com. Thank you so much. The help goes a long way and I am sincerely grateful for your support of the show no matter what happens. Now, you obviously think that the government can play a major part in preventing these things from growing and preventing future attacks, but that the real change needs to come from within the actual church itself. Can you explain those two parts? I, I can actually t explain it both from the uh, b spiritual perspective, but also just the social science. The social science tells us, yeah, there are societal level changes, systematic changes. The government is best positioned to do. It should be run by states, but funded by the federal government. We are spending a about 30 to $40 million a year on prevention. It's, you know, something like I've, I fought to get that. It seems low. 
I fought to get it from zero to 40. So I'm proud of that. But then, uh, yeah, it was supposed to go up and then it didn't go up. And then it's just kind of stayed stagnant. And the we've had some studies done by like Brookings and Rand and these think tank guys, right? That And they go look at other countries and they go look at our population size, the number of tax we have. We have more tax than everybody else. I'm sure you're shocked by that. They think we should be spending somewhere, it depends on the study, somewhere between 1 billion to 20 billion a year. And we're spending so 40 not million. 30 million. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, there are some programs that are working. There are small pilot projects that are working. So there, there are, there's like good news here. It's just not funded and it's not scaled yet. So I, that's kind of one of, at a governmental level or societal level, call your congressman and tell them to fund this. Like we could actually in our generation, before my kids have their own children, we could be drastically reducing the amount of mass attacks that we are having in this country on an annual basis. And what basis. would we be calling our Congress member to ask them to fund? What would be the thing to say? Ask them to fund violence prevention out of the Department of Homeland Security's Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. And actually, Lee, I'll be quite honest. If a congressman wants to take this up, I actually worked with Tom Malinowski out of New Jersey. He is no longer a congressman, but uh, he was a huge champion of this. If somebody else wants to become the champion of this, there's lots of ways that we could structure it. Like it doesn't have to be DHS. It could be DOJ. Like we can figure that part of it out. Right now, the structure is set up that it's the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships at DHS. CP3 is its shorthand. And it's getting, you know, peanuts, 30 million, 40 million. Yeah. It needs to be scaled. And that that would be something we could do at a societal level to to drastically decrease the, the number of attacks we're facing. So that's that's important. I still yeah. want government to do that. But the reality is that what is broken is happening more at a community level and at an individual level. You mentioned gun control. I write about gun control. I am a Second Amendment proponent. I grew up in Texas. And I think where we are right now is nuts. Like we have moved from uh, gun rights to gun fetish and fetishism. Yeah, yeah, yeah it <laughs> totally. is like crazy where we are right now. And after spending a lot of time with law enforcement over the last decade, they are asking for us to have some common sense gun reform. And and these are guys that like are are also usually very pro Second Amendment. And they're like, we we cannot keep up with this. So yes, we should be doing common sense gun reform. I, I just sadly don't see that happening anytime soon. It's still something we should fight for, but I don't want us to only do that because there are these other tools that in the mental health and social services community uh, that if we can get get them the resources we need, if we can train up folks on, on the science around how we help people off ramp from the pathway of violence, we should be able to do both. Yeah, but less people would be reaching for the guns. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so then, and then at the faith community, you're basically saying like, these guys have to get it together and to say like, look, we're off track, right? We are worshiping this false idol. We're cultivating hate and conspiracy. And these emotions are basically in direct contradictions to the teachings we claim to believe, right? We need exactly. to be talking yeah, and, at that level. And so here's the, here's the thing. Once somebody is radicalized, you can't talk them out of that ideology. The reason for that is because the unmet need is still there. And what actually led them to that ideology is not the ideology itself. It's that unmet need. So the approach is not, hey, I'm going to go talk to my uh, my friend or my aunt and uncle and tell them all of the reasons why they're wrong about fill in the blank, whether it's anti-government extremism or white supremacism, or if it's just, you know, I worship Donald Trump as my savior, you're probably not going to talk them out of it. But you can maintain relationship as long as it's safe for you and just model a healthier way, be curious, ask questions. And usually what happens is there's either an a individual life event that occurs or there can be a, you know, a society-wide type of event that causes that person to doubt that that ideology is, is meeting their needs. It won't come out quite out like that, but there's usually some sort of break and they are open 
to maybe rethinking things. And you want to be in their life as a safe person who loves them, who gives them that belonging, who gives them that significance, so that when they do become disillusioned with the ideology, they might be more open to having conversations about a healthier pathway. So that's important, but it's very hard work, very long-term. The people that I wrote this book for are the people that are not radicalized. It's the people that are in the middle who either know something is wrong in our community and they're trying to figure out what it is and what they should do about it. This is the book for you. Like I've tried to lay it out what happened. Um, But it's also for that middle ground group of people who are like, isn't everything fine? Isn't this all being blown out of proportion? I want to help them see like, no, we have a violence problem in this country and it is predominantly coming from our side, our community. Now that doesn't mean you are ever going to know somebody that is going to commit an attack. It is still extremely rare statistically for, for a mass attack to occur. But the thing that I like to challenge people on is that it's kind of, it's kind of like racism. If you are not actively pushing back against racism, then you are a part of the problem. If you are not actively pushing back against violence, you are a part of the problem. You are participating in the milieu of grievance narratives that incite and mobilize somebody to go commit that act. And it used to be that those conversations happened in very fringe elements. You had to seek it out. Those conversations now happen in primetime news TV, on Twitter, on mainstream social media. And if you aren't pushing back against it, it will continue to recruit people in. People who are vulnerable will get sucked into these narratives. And you, the biggest thing is that we we can't predict who is going to be the person that goes to commit the act of violence, nor would you want the government to pr- be able to predict that, right? Like, we don't want mi- minority report here. Minority report, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but we need to recognize that that it is it's not we we talk about them as lone actors they're not alone they've been in this massive conversation that is providing the justification for violence it's giving them the tactics for violence it's giving them the cause for violence and if you are not pushing back against that then you are complicit and that's what i hope to is more of like can i wake people up This isn't getting better. It's getting worse. Last year was our ninth year of increasing violence. So the curve is exponentially going up. Like, so if it keeps at this rate, you know, 10 years from now, we're we're dealing with unfathomable number of lives that will have been lost. But it doesn't have to be that way. That's the thing. It's like, we could actually change this. And it requires not only government action, but it requires individual and community action. It requires taking responsibility being held to account for our participation in creating that milieu. And then the other thing is being the the safe person for those that are radicalizing and hopefully per, over time persuading them back off of that path. Yeah, that it's us, you know, ordinary Americans, but particularly Christian Americans who should be working with their family and their small groups and their communities to really fight back against this narrative of marginalization and victimization and persecution, where they feel like they're at war, but they're not, where they're being radicalized because they think the stakes are life or death, but really they're the ones raising the stakes, which is also, you know, what I think about when you bring all these pastors and Christian leaders into the mix, right? Like when Trump was convicted, back in late May, you were out there pointing out that at least half a dozen of Trump's faith advisors spoke out against his conviction and called for the country to pray for the judicial system that had been weaponized, you know, to go after President Trump, which is, of course, not at all what happened. And while I can understand while the Trump family or Republican politicians or right wing pundits would want to spin that narrative, here you have Christian pastors helping lay the groundwork for this narrative of a broken and corrupted justice system that will only lead to violence. There's no way it can't lead to violence. And these are the people calling for prayer, but what they're really doing is pushing conspiracy theories and the judicial system is weaponized and that this trial is a sham and any conviction by a jury and, you know, is an abuse of power. And It's this undercurrent, I feel like, of spiritual warfare, which is like whose side God is on that is so dangerous, right? Because if God is on the side that makes the judge, the jury, any political opponents 
are now against God, right? That's a terrible position for our country to be in. That's right. For the the academics that study religious extremism, they consider religious yeah. extremism to be the most lethal historically, like not just modern t- terrorism, but like going back a thousand years. It has a psychological power over us. Um, just like you said, if you think God is on your side, then you can justify a lot of things. But most importantly, it's when we have religious authority figures that step in and they, they might outline why the enemy is evil, or they might outline the doomsday scenarios. And because they're this authority figure, they're a man of God, they're, you know, in, in communication with God, they must know something like some of these religious figures actually call themselves prophets and they don't prophesy very accurately. So I no, think the woman who's prophets, like Trump's but, prophet, she's yeah. like, he's going to get off. And yeah. then the next day she's like, just kidding. You know, God actually says this now. And you're like, come on. Exactly. Like at what point do people say she's just making this up? Yes. But still you, there are people that believe them. And, and so you have this authority that they pull from God. And then that gives people the motivation, the, and it's very emotional, all of that to say, it's very dangerous. Anytime you put religion into an ideology, it becomes more dangerous, more lethal. And it's also why, by the way, it's why politicians use religion, right? Like why Putin is trying to like make Russian Orthodox great again, why you see Uh, Throughout history, various emperors and kings try to use religion as like the the motivation behind why we're going to go to war here or why I'm passing this law over here. It, It has pretty significant power over human beings. And so more so than like a Steve Bannon going on his podcast and saying like, you know, we, we should get a rope and we should go find the judge. When you have these pastors making this a spiritual warfare, it really concerns me. It will lead to violence. It kind of no doubt in my mind that that's going to happen this year. Yeah. And one of the big things you talk about, of course, is the impact of social media, right, on these terrorist groups, how it enables the spread of of the hate and the conspiracies. And it also allows them to hide their networks of who's paying for these things. I mean, you were saying these lone wolf types, they're not alone, right? They're, they have a network of people surrounding them, either financially or ideology wise. You were recently on a podcast called Lawfare with Catherine Ballou, uh, who wrote a book on the history of violent white power movements in the U.S., And you were talking about an idea that it's not that the groups are necessarily growing all, you know, in these huge, huge, vast numbers. It's just that these groups are now asking different things of their believers. They don't necessarily need hundreds of people to march down a main street, although they are doing that. They need like three devoted people who might detonate a bomb, right? Right. And I think, oh, yeah, that, and that's where religion comes in because if I'm doing it on behalf of God, I'm basically a jihadist. I'm just an American jihadist, right? right? Like I think that this will be uh, on behalf of God. I'm saving the country. I'm doing this great thing. And so a lot of recruitment for these groups is online. You talk about how that misinformation online and on our media is working overtime and how we have, you know, Russian bots and other outside influences that have been so successful at spreading hate and conspiracy throughout our country and how many of these terrorist groups Groups are actually just repeating the same Russian talking points and how it's all connected, right? But it's hard to break that deception that you were talking about way back in December 2020 when you add God to the mix because it just ups the stakes because how do you fight back against people that think they're acting on behalf of God? Yeah, it the the structures are set up for us to fail here, right? Um, social media <laughs> is... I mean, it is Pandora's box that we opened. It's not going to go back. So many social ills uh, have come from it. And uh, I'm very enamored with Jonathan Haidt's research and Jean Twenge's research about the ways in which social media have led to increased anxiety and depression in our girls, increased apathy and nihilism in our boys. I'm I'm a parent of a 10 and 13 year old and and I'm like, oh, okay, (laughs) we now have this data. So we, we can maybe try to do it a little differently than the parents who had teenagers 10 years ago, but, but it's really hard when all of society has already adopted, you know, handing our cell phones to eight-year-olds at this point, you think about some of these massive shifts that we've endured as a culture beyond just social media and technology globalization, which now is several decades old, but it's still in the grand scheme of humanity, (laughs) 
very, very new, very new and hasn't shaken out yet. I mean, we offshore now we're onshoring and trying to find different ways to make sure that we can be sustainable in the next pandemic or if China decides to be, become more provocative, like it's just a very unstable world. And living with that uncertainty, uncertainty is something that extremists and authoritarians thrive in because they walk in, they lie and offer these like, I got your answer. I alone can fix I, it. I, kind I of can stuff. fix you yep. and you just need to trust me and I've got this. And we should be the smartest people on the planet in, in all of history, right? Because of all the knowledge we have access to. And yet- like it's amazing how quickly we we forget lessons from uh, you know, World War II from Nazi Germany. When people are feeling uncertain, we are so happy to give our rights away. We're so happy to trust somebody that has. I mean, if you think about Donald Trump, like he has not earned anybody's trust. Like, what has he done? Like, I worked in the administration. There was he didn't build a wall. He didn't do anything that he said, anything good. And I use the term good in the sense of you're a Republican conservative. You think what they did on this economic policy is good. That wasn't Donald Trump. That was like one of his Republican minions that just got to do whatever they wanted. And thankfully that particular batch of political appointees might have actually been competent. Donald Trump is not competent. He doesn't actually know how to deliver on any of this. And and that's, I mean, that's where I come to the conclusion that so much of this is just, we're deceived. Like my, I say, we, my community, my community is deceived. Like there, there, he's, this guy has not earned your trust. It is an uncertain, deeply uncertain world it is absolutely, there are plenty of things to be scared about, especially if you listen to cable news all day long, like you're constantly going to have those grievance narratives and the fear factor on over Great replacement theory. And these all people are it. coming for your jobs and these people are coming for your way of life. And we want your daughter and to your be a faith. boy and like all oh, of right. this stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, we're going to take your Bible. Yeah. I totally get why you're scared. I really do. I, what I don't get is why you think that guy is going to solve your problems. That's the part that I find like really hard to connect logically. Like part, even as I was studying the book, oh, okay, I can, I can see why we're vulnerable here. And I, I can see why this made us fall. And you're like, but this, this guy, like that's who yeah. you put your hope in. The disconnect is unbelievable. Yeah. Before you go, let me ask you, the full title of your book is Kingdom of Rage, The Rise of Christian Extremism, and The Path Back to Peace. So let's just, before you go, let's talk about that second part. What do you see as the path back to peace? Because clearly we're in real danger as a country, and there seems to be a lot of people who are just itching to bring violence to their fellow Americans because they've been pushed to a point where not only do they believe their country has been stolen from them, but they believe that God wants them to get it back. And as we were saying before, this is a very uniquely dangerous position because you know, if God wants you to do it, how can you turn him down? Right. And you made a career of keeping us safe. That has been your job, your whole career. So what can we do to help ourselves? And what can we do to help members of our government who still want to protect us at times like this? Yeah. The, the prescription, if you will, that I laid out in part two of the yeah. book, um, starts with looking at ourselves. There's a principle uh, that Jesus lays out that we should take the log out of our own eye before we try to take the uh, speck out of our neighbor's eye. And, and I think <laughs> for many in the Christian community, even the conservative community, you don't have to be a Christian to practice this principle. We need to self-reflect and see how we contributed to the problem. I certainly did that while I was reading this, uh, writing this book. I bet. I bet it was hard. And then, you know, you come to the next step. And, and again, this uh, from scripture, Jesus told Peter that when he was restored after he had denied Christ to go and strengthen his brothers. And that's kind of a similar thing. It's like, we need to repent. We need to acknowledge where we have contributed. And the Christian faith, we believe that we've been when we do genuinely repent, we are forgiven. And, but that's just where the work starts, right? Like then we need to go and do this work of reconciliation within 
our church community, short of being able to change the media structure. So if somehow you could, you could put Pandora back in the box and we didn't have social media. If we could have a new fairness doctrine or have some rules on social media, or you were financially hit if you were spreading disinformation, which is entirely possible. We could do that to the metas of the world. Yeah, that, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? But short of something happening at that massive scale, I don't see change occurring at a national level. I see change occurring at a grassroots level. I use a metaphor that I borrowed from uh, my friend, Dave Troy, and he was actually talking about disinformation, but it applies to me in the, the context of the polarization, the extremism that we're facing. And the metaphor is that of a forest fire. So we have a fire burning right now. First, we need to put out the fire and that, and that takes time. But then once the fire is out, you still have a number of cascading ill effects that occur from that, mudslides being most common. You're dealing with the, the ramifications of that in the environment for quite some time. The forest grows back. Forest fires do have a cleansing effect. They do bring renewal. You can also help them grow faster if you reseed in certain places. And what I'm suggesting here is that the work that we have in front of us is both putting out the fire, but also rebuilding and reseeding our communities with positive things. Because in that the other option here is that others will come in and reseed more disinformation, more polarization yeah, and start division. another fire. So yeah. I, I strongly encourage everybody, yes, pay attention to national politics, but really most important work that we have in front of us is rebuilding our communities, learning how to genuinely practice what it looks like to love our neighbor. We can love our neighbor through our vote. We can love our neighbor through practical means. We can love our neighbor by just turning the other cheek when they're mean to you, right? Like every, every place that you study, whether it's Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or Jesus, what is remarkable about those movements of nonviolence is, is not just that they were nonviolent, it's that they were creating a third way. They were creating this way of, I'm putting away my sword and I'm going to love you even though you might not in a worldly sense, be deserving of that love. But I'm going to, I'm still going to do that because that's what I've been called to. We need radical and extreme love. And that's doing that at a neighborhood level, at a community level, at a church level. That's what starts to rebuild our country to a place, not only that reduces violence, but is, you know, a, a place of thriving and a place of kindness and, you know, starts to, to heal us. That's the vision here is that, and it's a long, long-term vision. Like this does not get solved in the next 10 years. We're going to be dealing with this for quite some time, but we could start now and hopefully have a, a healthier community for our kids. Yeah. And that's essential. Long-term vision is very essential. I think we're not so good at it on the democratic side, but you know, you're saying that Christians are responsible for changing this Christian nationalism yes. crisis. The same way white people are responsible for dealing with racism, the same way men are responsible for dealing with rape culture and violence against women. It's the people that are perpetrating it that in many ways have to approach their own people and take control. I always say we're responsible for our people and never more so is that in this case, I think. Ultimately, you've written an incredibly timely book. As I said in the introduction, I think this is a really great book to read and then give to someone who believes they're a good Christian, but also say loves Trump, because this book can act as a bridge to start a real conversation between you and that person that could actually make change. And that's what we're talking about, that kind of local level where change can be made and then go forward from there. So please tell people the best place to buy it and where to follow your work moving forward, because obviously... We have to do a lot of work. <laughs> we do. You can find the book at any major bookstore, as well as independent bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, all the things. You can follow me on X, Facebook, and threads at New Summits, and that's spelled N-E-U-S-U-M-M-I-T-S. -E -S. You can also check out my website, elizabethnewman.org, and I'm just a couple of days away from launching a Substack. So if you go to my website, sign up for the newsletter, you'll get alerted when the Substack comes out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Elizabeth. And really, thank you so much for all the work you did, both to keep our country safe back when you were working in the administrations and to keep our country safe now, addressing this problem that is really, really causing us nothing but pain. 
Thank you so much for having me, Lee. I love the work that you are doing to bring health back to our country. Um, Keep it up. Well, I love this country. I believe in it. And I think we really can make this change if we really want to. Definitely. So that was Elizabeth Newman reminding us that this rising domestic terrorism movement is not getting better, it's getting worse. That we have to look at ourselves, particularly if we're in the American Christian community, and start seeding the ground for a different way of thinking. That it's not really about a particular ideology. What's actually broken in America is at the community level. Our society is sick, and we can't just keep dealing with the symptoms, we have to address the underlying disease. That the goal must be to eradicate the tool of terrorism. And yes, that's going to take government prioritizing and funding programs to help that, but we can be part of the solution by giving people a place to belong and be loved so they feel like they're far less likely to be radicalized. We need to be having these big conversations and maybe sharing a book like Kingdom of Rage with the people in your life who might need it. I want to thank Elizabeth for joining us today and you for caring enough about the future of this nation to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Happy 4th of July. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.